Perhaps you might also want to add that he was the latest winner of the Jean Nanotti Prize. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, and this is important because this was the reason I read him. Uh, and this is quite important because the people who are here, they're specialists on Jeanne Marie. And I, uh, from this point of view, what I'm going basically to present does not pretend at all of kind of a deep understanding critic. And plus, I have read basically three things from him outside of the limits. I went with the aging and suicide. And this is quite, uh, I'll try to tell you why it comes there. But from this point of view, I'll try really to much more make how will Mary resonate with me and certain questions about enlightenment that uh, are overcoming from Susan? And here's the story. When you're reading this three, when you're reading it basically late in your life, what struck me is, is this not three chapters of the same book? And here is, an, in a certain way, Limits was written 20 years after the experience that he had. He wrote on aging before he became old. He wrote in aging when he was in his 50s. And basically, obviously, he wrote about suicide before doing it. Uh, and I'm saying this because, in my view, there is something interesting about enlightenment, which was in the essay uh, which uh, uh, Susan was giving us, and in my view, his understanding of this. And in my view, his definition of enlightenment and what he likes about enlightenment is to live your life without fearing the future. And living your life without fearing the future is possible because he believes in alignment allowed to distinguish between the fear of death and fear of dying. And this is why what is happening in the camp and what is happening in the old age, for him there was a certain similarity. And this is obsession with dying, not with death. Enlightenment does not make people basically immortal, but it basically created the feeling that you can live without the fear of dying. And this is the fear of dying that is shaping the camp experience and then basically aging. And this is why for him suicide was in a certain way an enlightenment institutions. And he, if I like my, uh, trust my English translator, started to use the German word for voluntary death. You can decide how to die. And this was something that a religious person cannot do it. And in a certain way, even a Marxist should not do it if he really believes <laughs> that the future is there. I'm saying this because for me, the most interesting uh, several points that I do is the following. First, we talk about him as an intellectual. But strangely enough, it was the fact that it was so difficult for him in the concentration camps that give him legitimacy to be an intellectual. I have lived for the last 10 years in Vienna. And listen, if you're born in Vienna, when he was born, and if you have not uh, graduated college, and if you are not a doctor, how you can pretend to be an intellectual? <coughs> he was an autodidact. And in my view, this is the most interesting figure of the Enlightenment anyway. But from this point of view, you cannot take yourself as an intellectual without taking people around you in your Vienna uh, surroundings saying, how do you know this? He does not have a successful book, which basically, before he went to the camp, that can prove this. He understood that he's intellectual in the camp. And here is uh, something that I found really interesting, important. And this is the difference between camp experience, prison experience, and the idea of uh, the role of the intellectual. There is a famous text by Alexander Watt, one of the great Polish uh, writers, called My 20th Century. Uh, it was very much done together with Milos about his experience in a uh, Soviet camp in the 1940s where he was there, an intellectual among criminals. And by the way, criminals, this, at this moment, Polish-Ukrainian relations were quite tense. How he survived? <coughs> he survived by the classical intellectual story. He was telling stories. He was basically telling them the classical literature and making people identify. So he was entertaining the other prisoners in the cellar, and this is how he survived. I mean, this is why he was not killed. This is impossible in the camp. He started in the camp because in the camp you were working. There is no free time in the camp. There is no possibility for you to tell stories because you simply should do this physical work when you are not tortured, and then basically, uh, it's very important that you cannot do anything useful from the point of view of this life. And this is why the idea of the prison and intellectual activity is totally different in our imagination. It's Gramsci. Uh, 
uh, people are studying prisons were called the education, the schools uh, for intellectuals. So these distinctions between camp and prison and the figure of the intellectual and how you experience it, I found quite important. Because this is this absence of any free time which can allow you. And secondly, enlightenment intellectual in the way he understands it, somebody very much about reason and analytical thinking, he's not in the business of telling stories. This is not about retelling things. You cannot play Shekherazada. Uh, and this is how you basically survive in moments like this. This is where your education helps you. This is basically where you're positioning. And for me, this was critically important because uh, when I went on this, this kind of a living life in which you're not fearing death, uh, you're fearing this, but death is fine. You can live with the fear of death, but these distinctions between dying and death, in my view, make it so important, uh, the identity of the victim. And here is, because resentment, that uh, I very, uh, I, what Moshe said very much resonated with me. Resentment is something that we see around us all the time. And uh, like Stephen, basically, somebody who was doing Russia uh, recently, I have seen also resentment of a different type. So I was asking myself, where is the difference of the resentment which, for example, I have seen in President Putin and the resentment of Amiri? By the way, President Putin is a very resentful man. And here is the distinctions between the resentment of the loser and the resent resentment of the victim. Uh, this is a different story. In a certain way, victim is never going to ask the experience to be repeated just in order to have a different outcome. Victim cannot escape from this experience, but the idea that let's try again, let's play it again, <laughs> and then probably I'm going to win this time. This is not a victim's identity. Loser's identity is exactly like this. And here, Amiri has in his essay on resentment something that I found extremely powerful. When he was talking about kind of his mistrust, what is happening in Germany in the 1960s, it was not simply that the Germans were not facing uh, basically the past, but he was very much obsessed with easiness with which Germany is changing. It was too easy. In a certain way, uh, this was, in my view, what was very much shocking for him is that Germans very easily from good Germans became Nazis, but also very quickly from Nazis became non-Nazis. And this easiness of the story, in a certain way, worried him. First, because this easiness made what happened to him, in a way, accidental. So in a certain way, it can change uh, all the time. You can go this and that. There is no substance. There is no identity. But secondly, it means that it can go again. And I have seen this, by the way, uh, fear of easiness of change very strongly in Eastern Europe for the last 30 years. You're going to see a lot of particularly people all on resistance and others, spending a lot of time in prisons, all their life being shaped by this. They have personally be offended and resenting the easiness with which the transition took shape. Exactly because it became so easy, their anti-communist or resistance identity became problematic. In the world in which communists can disappear overnight, or Nazis can disappear overnight, the previous resistance loses its values. And I'm asking this story because in a certain way, easiness is also something that was very deep in the resentment that I have been seen on the Russian side and particularly in the, uh, on the Putin side. This is not about Soviet Union collapsing. This is about collapsing so easy. This was the problem, how it happened, that the nuclear power that cannot be militarily defeated collapsed overnight and nobody defended it including Putin himself, and nobody committed a suicide. Could it be that the Soviet identity was so meaningless? And if you go there, and if you see basically the war in Ukraine, this is in different way, and this is many, but it's very much about identities. And here, very much some of the thinking of Amiri, in my view, is interesting to see what is happening. Because what I see is the destruction of all these legacy identities that came out of the World War II as a result of what was happening there. And I'm going to give you four cases of discussions that we had in order to demonstrate this. Listen, the first is a big debate that comes out of a poem that was not published, 
Uh, but in the early 1990s, Brodsky wrote on the independence of Ukraine. And this is a very kind of a nasty text, uh, which was very strongly used with uh, legitimate reasons by many Ukrainians today, in which he said, Ukrainians, what you do, what you believe you're doing, do you really believe that living is something? When you're going to die, you're going to remember the words of Pushkin, not the words of Tarashevchenko. It, but, it, but, here's the, but it is an interesting story. In the Ukrainian uh, interpretation, this is a major argument that at the end of the day, all this cosmopolitan, great Russian cultural tradition is simply Russian imperialism and nationalism of a different side. If this is true, there is no major difference between Solzhenitsyn and Brodsky. But everybody who knows the story of the two, this does not come easily. Because first, this poem was written in English. Secondly, Brodsky, like Solzhenitsyn, was never particularly kind of obsessed with the Russian tradition. He never wanted to go back to the country. So this was the most cosmopolitan of the great uh, uh, poets being born in the Soviet Union. So where comes his resentment towards Ukrainian independence? Why it became so personal for him? Why he who supported the Baltic movements for independence went so tough on Ukraine? Is it so much really that he also believes that Ukrainians and Russians are the same people? And this is the interpretation that you're going to uh, listen these days. But reading Kameri, I was very much hinted by a totally different interpretation. What Brodsky really hated about the Ukrainian independence is that this is going to make him a Russian poet. A Russian poet. He wanted to be a world poet. He always wanted to be like this. He was writing in English. He was very much really influenced, by the way, by the older and others. He was in love with the Polish culture. But when he see this kind of a cultural space of Russian language was an imperial being basically uh, totally disintegrating on the national languages, everybody, Pushkin, <laughs> him and so on, are becoming just a Russian poet. And he wanted to be something more than a Russian poet. And in a certain way, the Ukrainians pushed him to be this, because he was more than a Russian poet because he was anti-Soviet, Soviet poet. And the Soviet identity was very different than this. And I'm saying this because I go for the second case. And this is a kind of one of the most, on one level, farcical and the most tragic of this. Uh, when the Russian troops uh, entered in one of the Ukrainian uh, at towns these days, they were met by an old lady with a Soviet flag. And this was a famous meme, it goes here and there. Uh, so this lady, in a certain way, did not understand anything, honestly speaking. Because the moment when the Russian troops entered Ukraine, one thing that was totally destroyed was a Soviet identity. She was the last Soviet person because he did not understand that there was no Soviet identity anymore. Soviet identity means that before it, for years, there were Russian speakers on the territory of Ukraine who can live their lives without asking their questions, are they Russians or Ukrainians? This was the Soviet legacy. The moment the Russian troops entered, you're either Russian or Ukrainian. In the way, basically, during the Yugoslav war, you're either Muslim or Serb. You cannot be Yugoslav anymore, or you can be Yugoslav in Berlin, but you cannot be Yugoslav there because then, basically, you don't have your sight. And I'm saying this because uh, a lot of people these days not understanding this type of a, con destroying the constructions and identities that came as a result of the World War II, does not understand that also, in a strange way, the discourse of uh, Second World War that is justified have been also destroyed. All these identities we're, we're talking about was based on a certain common understanding of what happened during the World War II. And this is not there, and I'm going to give you my third example. You have a Russian president claiming that he's in Ukraine to denazify Ukrainians. What exactly it means? Basically, it means he wants to remove Zelensky. But this is the language, forget. On the other side, you have the Ukrainians, it might be legitimately saying, that they attacked in the way Germans attacked them in the 1941 to the extent that in one of the villages, a Ukrainian journalist told me that she took two old ladies talking about the Russian troops that were there and who left saying when the Germans were here. But suddenly, 
And for me, this is, uh, this, is this kind of a uh, strange story. Who is the mediator in this war? Israel. One of the mediators in the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, in which basically everybody claims that they're fighting Nazis, is the state of Israel. And I'm saying this because all the major identities that came out of the World War II, the identity of Germany as a civilian power, the Soviet identity as an anti-fascist power, the Israeli identity as basically keeping the memory of the Holocaust, all this is totally destroyed. So in a certain way, while we talk about Europe, Europe does not have a common language anymore. Because the common language was the language of the World War II, interpreted differently. For sure, in Soviet Union, it was the victory and so on. And this was very much why the Ukrainian should be Nazi. Because this is the only way to russify Soviet victory. If you basically go in the history of the war, the biggest uh, places in which the most people died have been Belarus. Every third person had been killed. Ukraine. Uh, so it was a Soviet Union. It was a Soviet war. It was all these people. And then suddenly it becomes a Russia war. And it becomes a Russia war for a very important reason. Because there was a Lenin Soviet Union, which was an ideological project. It was about communism and it based on the anti-Russian nationalism. And this was a Stalin Soviet Union, which was very much also based basically on the Russian nationalism defending Soviet Union during the war. And I do believe that these changes and these uh, identity things uh, could be easily interpreted if you're reading Kameri. He was sensitive about this. He was sensitive how the war created totally different identities and how fragile these identities are. And I'm going to end up, as a result of it, just to claim that from this perspective we're going to have, if we're going to use these uh, lenses, we're going to have also a very different idea of what is landing on a different level. Uh, we have been discussing this a lot with uh, Stephen Holmes, and the question is, are you not surprised how the war in Yugoslavia disappeared out of our discourse when the war in Ukraine started? This is amazing. In a certain way, listen, you have two communist federations that disintegrated. When Yugoslavia was collapsing, the major fear is what is going to happen if it's going to be repeated in the Soviet Union. So why nobody talks about it? And there are three reasons which are much more practical, because Putin had been so much misusing the analogy with Kosovo to justify his actions, so you're not using this because your enemy is doing this. But in my view, there is something much more profound, and this is about the changing identity of the role of the West in the world that comes. The war in Kosovo was a paradigmatic war because it was based on three major principles. We are defending somebody who is not like us, Muslims. We are defending them, nevertheless, that they do not have oil. And we are defending them in order to show how much the world has changed. So this was kind of a war which was interested and important, not because of what is going to happen on the ground, but on the base of this liberal universalism and humanitarian intervention and so on as a totally different paradigm. So go now with the war in Ukraine. In a certain way, we're defending them because they're like us. I mean, also politically. And we're defending them basically because they cannot defend themselves and because there is a nuclear power against them. But in a certain way, this is a different political identity. And this idea of, uh, and uh, I'm going to end up on this, on this, I do believe in a strange way, and I could be wrong. Amiri was interesting, but he was much more mistrustful to the claim of the enlightenment, of the universal principle that can be taken out of everything else. That you can, that the only way to prove your enlightenment identity, you should care only about people who are very different than you. That basically, uh, defending your own does not count. Suddenly, it counts. And this is why the idea to believe that we are coming back to the Cold War is wrong, in my view. Cold War was ideological identities very much anchored in the future. This was true with the Western world. It was true with the Soviet world. What we see is an identity wars. And in these identity wars, this type of uh, cosmopolitan identities that were very much preconditioned on the Cold War are much more problematic than ever before. <laughs>
And from this point of view, making the distinctions between the resentment of the victim and the resentment of the loser, in my view, is critically important. The loser is not asking neither for forgiveness or for a basically revenge. It's about payback. Let's play it again, and this time I can win. Uh, so from this point of view, a loser is about uh, the estate of the grandfather uh, uh, and not about the life of the grandfather, if I'm going to use Steve's uh, Machiavelli quote. So this was kind of a very Bulgarian interpretation of Ameri. <laughs> Questions? Susan. So thank you, Ivan, as usual. Lots of rich insights. Um, there are couple Hello, hello. Hello? Yes? Okay. So, thank you for the insights. Are there three points in which I disagree with you? They may not be the most important ones, but I will just go through them quickly. You talked about the historical irony of Israel mediating between Russia and Ukraine. Um, David or Moshe may know better than I do, but what I have heard um, from many Israeli friends is um, that was all for show. They're not, Bennett is not doing any serious mediating and never intended to. What he intended to do was to get off out of the awful moral position of doing nothing except, you know, shining the Ukrainian and the Russian flag on the walls of the old city because he doesn't want to piss off uh, Russia. Um, so, I, so I don't think it was a serious attempt at mediating at all, and I haven't heard anything about it since the beginning of the war. Well, I could be wrong. That's one point. Um, second point, you said that Amory became an intellectual because of the concentration camp. I don't think that's true, actually. Um, and we forget, certainly in the German-speaking world and probably in a number of others, it was possible to, to become a real intellectual in that generation without going to university. I mean, I know somebody who became the, later the president of the Deutsche Akademie für Sprache und Dichtung. Um, you know, you, you probably wouldn't get a university job, but you could certainly be an absolutely respected intellectual, publish lots of books and so on. Now, Amory's first book was not very good. I've read it, um, you know, because I tried to read basically everything. But um, that he was in intellectual circles in Vienna. Um, and, I mean, autodidact, he was around a lot of people, um, you know, read everything. But that was less uncommon, I think, than it certainly would be now to be an intellectual without a degree. And the last thing is, I think, um, a little more substantive. You talk about, um, towards the very end, you talk about the Enlightenment being abstract. Um, sometimes, although I'm always struck by even how the figures of the classical Enlightenment are much less abstract than, um, you know, even most of the philosophers of the 19th century and certainly the philosophers of the 20th um, were all out there. So they talk about real events in real historical time in different places. Um, and so does Amory, of course. I mean, Amory is, is always insisting on the particular and on the concrete and on the the um, subjective, but I want to go to, back to Moshe's point this morning, um, which is to remember, contrary to the counter-enlightenment thinking that we're always subject to, and Stephen is right to say it's roughly the same song that they've been singing for 250 years, um, you know, the abstraction is inhuman and it's all empty and doesn't have any comment. 
Abstraction can be an achievement to abstract from all the tribes in the world to the idea of the human is, is a feat that doesn't rule out being interested in different kinds of people in all the ways that his, history and time and space can make them. But abstraction shouldn't only be looked as, as it were, draining concepts of content. It can also be um, something to aspire to. Thank you very much. Uh, on the first, I totally agree with you. Of course, the, the interesting story is that for Israel, the symbolic politics of this doesn't matter. Why Israel is doing this is quite obvious. They have strategic reasons, the economic reasons, and they didn't want to sanction. At the same time, they didn't want to look as they don't want to join the sanctions of the Western world. And by the way, President Putin was one of the most Israeli-friendly leaders you can imagine. But this is the interesting story. This is the end of the Israeli identity, believing that for them, symbolic politics, as somebody who basically is guaranteeing the central importance of the Holocaust and all this talk about Nazis, who is fascist, who is not fascist, suddenly Israeli said, we are not interested in this part of the conversation. And of course, Lavrov did his best when he basically said that uh, Hitler was also partially Jewish in order to make all this work just farcical to the extent that you cannot comment anymore. But this is what I mean by certain type of a World War II legacy that was part of the Cold War is over. For the Israelis, this is not as important anymore. They can afford this. And by the way, this is also very interesting in the discourse of President Zelensky. President Zelensky, everybody is talking about his Jewishness just to show uh, the lack of ethnic nationalism, which by the way is true. But the most interesting is for him, the model is Israel. 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 He said basically that he said Ukraine because of a democracy in war. So it's not uh, about this and that. I'm saying this because I always believe that what we're seeing in the last years is this movement from the Jewish century to the Israeli century. Uh, and the Jewish century being very much about, very much rooted in the Enlightenment, that the emancipation of any kind of a nation is possible only by the emancipation of everybody. And then to a story that, in a certain way, this type of a national identity, tribal identities, and so on, they matter. And the problem is how they're going to be organized. And from this point of view, you're going to see this, of course, in Eastern Europe, very popular. You have traditional political groups and parties that historically was very anti-Semitic and very pro-Israelis at the same time. Because they didn't like Jews when they're in their countries, but they basically really believe that if there is a country that has achieved East European dream for national sovereignty autonomy, this is Israel. Economically successful, military powerful, and in a certain way an ethnic democracy. Uh, and I do believe this is an interesting story which allows us to read differently basically what is going on. On your second question, listen, you know so much more than me on this. But, uh, uh, simply for me, the interesting story because Amiri is a very sensitive person. Calling himself an intellectual, some people easily can do it. Uh, but it was in the camp and basically because of his experience in the camp that he knew that he is intellectual. Because this was how he experienced the world and by the way how others have been treating him there. Uh, uh, this is why, but it, it is probably a long, uh, wrong argument. I easily go, uh, go with you. And then on this idea of human, and this is the story, and I do believe this is the tragedy of people like Brodsky. In the moment when identity politics takes over ideological politics, it's very difficult to distinguish between imperial and universal. Between imperial and universal. Listen, when, uh, when Brodsky said, oh, you're going to read Pushkin and not Taras Boba, you're not going to read Pushkin if you're seeing the death from the Russian gun. You're going to read Taras Boba. Uh, not Tar Taras Shevchenko, I'm sorry. You're going to read Taras Shevchenko. And this is what is happening. And from this point of view, in the moment of identity politics, universalism becomes suspicious. It becomes suspicious because you basically said, is this about humanity above national, or it is about rejecting other people to have the national identity that others have? And this is what I had in mind, yeah. Stephen Holmes. Yeah, so it's, I think it's pretty clear that the Russian attack on Ukraine does, has nothing to do with ideology. Yeah. It's about identity, it's about 
you are actually us. You may not admit it. You don't want to admit it. But you are like us. And they're saying, no, we're not like you. So it is about that. But the idea that identity wars have no future reference, I think, needs to be deepened a bit. Because there is a way in which Putin seems to be afraid of the next generation. That is, uh, his desire to kind of exor the exorcism of the West. Because the younger people are going to be tempted by this. And part of what's happening seems to be that he wants to saddle Russia with a, an adventure, a, a bleeding wound that future generations can't get out of. It's a kind of, he's giving them, putting them in a situation where they can't escape. So say something a little bit more about how the future and generational relations are affected by these identity wars. Listen, uh, first President Putin is totally obsessed with the American cultural wars. One of the first comments that he did basically, he identified Russia with canceling Russia with uh, the rollings canceling and so on. And part of it is, in my view, something that America has noticed. This is the easiness of change. The easiness with which you can become from men, women, the easiness from which you can become from Russian Ukrainians, this kind of a, this type of identity, it basically means that if you're a leader of a regime that does not have a succession mechanism, in a, one of uh, Putin's closest advisors once said something that I never said, heard anything so fatalistic, he said, if there is no Putin, there is no Russia. So, but if he's right, even President Putin is not immortal. So if this is the case, what is the legacy? What is kind of an identity that you can have? And then you should try to insist that they're almost biological identities, which are keeping civilizations and others. And we have been talking a lot about this. And for me, this is kind of uh, probably it's going to be interesting to share this. But uh, people now, when they talk that there is a colonial war, they believe that it's about land. It's not about land, it's about people. Uh, uh, Russia is quite a big place. Uh, mm -hmm. No, no, they have quite a lot of land. Uh, the problem is that there is not enough Russians. So three months before the war, on several occasions, President Putin was making one and the same statement. He was quoting the famous Russian chemist from the 19th century, Mendeleev, who said that in year 2001, there are going to be 500 million Russians in the world. 500 million Russians in the world, they should be in year 2001. This is what Mendeleev said at the end of the 19th century. But they are now 150 million. And he explained this with revolution, with war, with this and that. But this fact that you have a demographically declining country with a huge space explain a situation which we're seeing in Ukraine today. This is about basically capturing people. Uh, you're moving people within Russia. We're talking about more than a million and a half people. We're talking particularly about capturing children, 180,000, and a lot of them being orphans. And they came with a special legislation allowing for fast adoption of kids. Uh, and thanks to, uh, to Stephen, I learned about something that is called morning wars. Morning wars were taken in a kind of a pre-colonial period in the United States. This was between some of the Iroquesi tribes, in which you're attacking the other tribe because you want to get their women and children, because you don't have enough people in your tribe. And I do believe that this type of a demographically driven wars are critically important in aging and shrinking societies. Listen, Russia lost, they have one million excess deaths as the result of COVID. This is big, by the way. Why I, I can talk a lot about what is happening with Russian demography, but this is changing the imagination. And President Putin himself was obsessed with Russia's demography. He was talking a lot about this. He believed that his major achievement in the first 10 years is that he reversed the process, and then the process basically was reversed again in a negative story. So this type of idea of population, and then you don't need Russians. You need Russians, and there are no kids, and the only way to go close to Mendeleev is if Ukrainians are Russians, if Belarusians are Russians.
Uh, and I totally this understanding of a kind of a war is driven by the demographic imagination. And here comes Stephen's story. We have a lot of uh, data about the support for the war. The support for the war is much lower among the younger population, but also for very obvious reasons. They're the only one that should fight. Uh, and, and this is a strange story. This is not simply a kind of a cultural choices, but they don't understand exactly. By the way, this is not that they like the West. There is at the moment he managed to consolidate, but they don't want to fight. Uh, so they don't want to fight. And in my view, this is the story, and this is also the paradox of an ethnic identity war in which 40% of the troops are coming from ethnic groups that has nothing to do with uh, the Slavic population. Mm -hmm. You had people coming from Altai, Buryatia, and so on, who are killing Ukrainians to convince them that they are Russians. Uh, 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 so I think all this, because from this point of view, this identity politics is becoming critically important, but it puts in a very difficult corner, the idea of humanity as a whole, because suddenly, from the point of view of the Ukrainians, Brodsky cannot be a universal great world poet, which in my view he is. He's immediately becoming Russian imperialist who wants them to read Pushkin and not Shevchenko. And this is type of a position that in my view is very, very difficult to be sustained. So you would think that if he, if he wants to face it, like, it's very interesting. If Putin is after population gain, uh, then he can't possibly settle just for Donetsk and Luhansk because their population before the war was maybe two and a half million together. At now, it's probably a million and a half, a million. So they can't, that won't add very much to 160 million. So if the population of the Ukraine was 40 million, now 10 million have left, so 30 million, that's a significant number. You would, you would predict that he would want all of Ukraine. No, I don't believe that he can do it anymore. This is a different story, what you want and what you can do. Uh, but uh, the other story is that uh, uh, depopulation of Ukraine, because Ukraine's demographic dynamics is not better than Russia. So, uh, and this is one of the interesting questions which is going far away from our talk on Amiri. And this is the questions, who is losing from a prolonged conflict? If you're going to have, uh, keep in mind that uh, around 56% of all Ukrainian kids are now outside of Ukraine. Sorry. 56% of all Ukrainian children under 14 are outside of Ukraine. Uh, because most of the people that we have in Poland and other countries, this is basically women with kids because uh, uh, young men do not have uh, basically the legal right to leave the country. But if this kind of a, uh, children go to Austrian or German school and they stay for more than one year, the likelihood that the family goes back is going to be significantly reduced, plus you keep in mind this is a country which is destroyed in a dramatic way. So you can end up with this depopulation, and I'm saying this because what really triggered uh, uh, kind of reading uh, uh, Amiri, which was very much interesting for me, was exactly this what you're realizing and also what come very much from Moshe is they are different resentments. The resentment of the victim who cannot change his identity and the resentment of the loser who believes that he lost by accident, by chance. Uh, he cannot, he can never forgive that in a certain way those before him allowed this to happen, so we should try again. Uh, the CIA director, Bill Burns, and he's probably one of the best that basically knows Russia at President Putin, he called uh, Putin the apostle of the payback. Uh, and this is the story. We should try again. It could be different this time. So this is not that we want a new Cold War. We try to reenact it. But because we are reenacting the World War II, the Cold War, suddenly the future disappears because basically we are very much in a kind of a restaging games. But these restaging games are destroying the experiences behind it. And from this point of view, this was quite interesting because uh, Tony Jan has something that I found very profound. He said, the problem of the modern world is that we are not interested in history, only in the lessons of history. So we are repeating never again and so on, but you're never interested anymore how it happened, what it means, what was the experience. 
Uh, this is, uh, from, uh, from this point of view, history was replaced by sociology, if we're going to trust the definition that Stephen King gives. Um, yeah, the question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, about Tommaso Bart College Bullet. So I'm, I'm wondering about this distinction between the two resentments, and it, and it seems to me that if we were to apply it to Ukraine, it wouldn't quite fit, because you could claim that Ukraine was a victim of Russia slash the Soviet Union big time. And certainly there is a way of telling that history that, that would highlight that. Um, but what they succeeded is precisely to change their identity, right? They, they kind of, or at least that's the story that we like to hear in the West, right? That they embraced the West, they rejected that, they said, no, we are going to be different, we can be different. We're, we're Western, we're European, we stand for democracy. Yes, there is corruption, but we're going to deal with so on. And, and that you could read the Russian response as resentment precisely. You managed to do what we tried and failed to do, right? There was a pro-democratic, pro-liberal moment in Russia of which President Putin was a part, maybe a leader, that failed. So, so I'm wondering whether... Um, whether the, res the identity-based resentment is the, as, as, as fatal as, as you claim it is, and whether Russian resentment is really one calling for revenge. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, first of all, I'm talking about Putin's sense of resentment. Uh, uh, Ukraine's is not a loser's resentment. It's a victim, but in different story, and I'm going to make. Uh, because resentment discourse was very strong, uh, starting with 2007. Basically, this was the identity of the Putin's regime. We were betrayed by the West. We were mistreated. We were promised things that were never given to us, and so on, NATO enlargement, and so on. Uh, and from this point of view, this was a resentment which, on the February 22nd, ended up with a speech which declared that Russian people were the major victim of the Soviet regime. On the day he basically recognized Donetsk and Lugansk, he said, Russian people ethnic Russians, was the biggest victim of the Soviet Union. And in a certain way, okay, you can even claim this, because part of the Soviet bargain was Russians get power at the cost of a weak identity, which means that in all other republics of the Soviet Union, there were National Communist Party and there were national governments. But there was no Russian Communist Party and there was no Russian government during the Soviet Union. So the center was void because this was critically important in order to allow the Russians to dominate others, honestly speaking, because in each of the republics, number one was an ethnic representative, number two was an ethnic Russian. Uh, so this was a bargain in which, and this, by the way, has a lot to do with something that we see in the United States with respect to the white uh, uh, groups. In a certain way, the idea was democracy is for the majority rights for minorities, exactly because the political system does not work for them. And suddenly the majority started to envy minorities for their strong identities. Uh, suddenly Russians started basically to envy Baltics, Georgians, and others because they know exactly who they are. They have their own interests, while the Russian kind of identity became very ill-defined. It was so ill-defined that even 10 years ago, the majority of the Russian public doesn't know when is the day of the country, national day. Do you know where is the Russia's national day? June 12th, because it came Yeltsin's constitution, which nobody was uh, interested in the first one. Secondly, 57% of the Russians believe that the uh, borders of the country are temporarily. Some believe that the country should go bigger, but some were afraid that it's going to be smaller because of Chechnya and all this. So in a certain way, you have a country which also, the hymn of the Russian Federation was also a strange creature because it was the Soviet music on a new words, but they were written by the same poet who wrote the Soviet hymn. Uh, so all these identity issues, which makes Russian identity much more problematic than any other identity on the post Soviet space. And here comes basically the Ukrainian resentment, which is totally different and also one of the important. What Russia did to Ukraine was not simply denying them uh, identity and so on, but it was the humiliation that came after the annexation of Crimea. And the humiliation came from the fact that Ukrainians did not fight back. 
in Crimea. They fought back in Donbass, but there were 20,000 Ukrainian troops when the Russians went with their special operation, and none of them really fought back. To the extent that of all uh, ships of the Ukrainian Navy in Sevastopol, only one uh, declared that they will not surrender, and when the Russians said, surrender, or we are going to destroy you, uh, the captain of this ship said, we Russians do not surrender. <laughs> so, j j just, just imagine what, and then you are never going to understand what happened now if you don't know this history. When basically on the Snake Island, a small group of the Russia, of Ukrainian border guards, who do not have any chance to resist basically Russian pressure, had Russian ship go and fuck yourself, this was for Crimea. We are different. Uh, there was a Ukraine, and I find this important because I know this argument about democratic fear of the Russia, the democratic transition. But to be honest, opinion polls does not support it. Ukraine in the eyes of the Russians was not what West Germany was in the eyes of East Germany. Keep in mind the GDP per capita of Ukraine was much lower than Russia before the war started. Keep in mind that 70% of the Ukrainians, 10 years before the war, have been very positive on President Putin. So, of course, there was pro-Western elites in Russia that much more wanted to live in Ukraine than they wanted to live in Russia. But this was not the mass appeal that the way of life, uh, of life in West Germany has on East Germany. Now this is an identity where it's totally different. Exactly because all this Soviet identity that was lingering in places like Donbass and others was destroyed by Russian troops. Now you should decide who you are. And to be honest, the vast majority decided that they are Ukrainians. Most of the people who are fighting there are Russian speakers. They never spoke Ukraine, some of them. And, and this is the interesting story, but in a certain way, this is also Brodsky's story, because he knew that the moment this is going to happen, Russian language is going to disappear from the... Many of the parents that are fighting now and the Russian speakers, they are not going to teach their kids Russian language anymore. It becomes the enemy language. In a way, the German language was uh, really very difficult to take for many Soviet citizens in 50s and 60s. So I find this story about identity, which uh, this is why I... It's good to say that basically uh, uh, Putin feared that uh, Ukrainian democracy is going to inspire democracy in Russia. By the way, he feared something totally different, that a man from nowhere, like Zelensky, overnight can become a president. This he feared. Because if this happened, it can happen anywhere. But it was not the power of attraction of the Ukrainian democracy before the war. Now it's different. Now you have the proud nation. This was not exactly the case before the war started. Martin Schad had a question. <laughs> Thanks, Ivan, for the fireworks of, of possible explanations of the, cry, of the war in Ukraine, which left me a bit bewildered, actually, I have to admit. Um, there you have it. You make it very strongly, your argument about this is a demographically driven war. Yes. At the same time, you say this is an identity war. And those two things I just can't get together in my head because one of them, the first one, is hyper-realpolitik, if you like, and the identity side of things is a, is a mess, obviously, as you <laughs> yourself uh, rightly pointed out. Um, and I just don't get these two arguments together. Can you help me with that? Yeah. yeah? Uh, no. Just one more thing. Uh, it, whilst you help me with that, could you also tell me a little bit more about the role of Peter the Great. Yeah, it's a good story. Uh, uh, so uh, the interesting story, and I do believe it's a very, very good question, is the following. If you are facing demographic decline, and if you are basically starting to define your nation in ethnic terms, this is not about opening borders for anybody who is going to come. This is about where are the Russians. And then if you basically have this obsession, Ukrainians are Russians. The Russians are Russians. Uh, and this is why you go there, and of course there are many other things that push President Putin to believe that it's enough to basically dismiss uh, the pro-Western elites in Ukraine and basically the ordinary Ukrainians are going to see themselves as Russians. But this explains, in my view, also the language on which he's trying to justify what is going on. 
because the Ukrainians were pushed from the Russians to choose between being Russians or being Nazi. This is denazification. If you basically are not Russian, you're Nazi, and this is basically this obsession with Nazification, which goes, which is, to be honest, the level of ridiculousness is so high that even the Russians are not taking it seriously because this is, there are certain things that people. But this story is, and in my view, this kind of a transformation of a, in 1920s, in order to transform a uh, Russian empire into a Soviet Union, uh, Lenin created new identities of the republics, and basically he declared Russian chauvinism the biggest enemy of the Soviet project. And now you should transform this same Soviet empire, which was based on a totally different idea of identity, into an ethnic state. And this is where, and where comes Peter the Great, there is uh, somebody was uh, telling me recently, uh, talking uh, to the Russian foreign minister and said, but who is advising now the president on this and that? And absolutely seriously, Lavrov has answered this person. He said, President, at the moment, he has only three close advisors. Ekaterina the Great, Peter the Great, and Ivan the Terrible. <laughs> uh, 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 but, but this is a different story, and this has something to do with the idea of time. And it's not about biological time. It's not about social time. It's about historical time. If you start to buy the idea of ethnic identities is something that cannot be changed, then suddenly uh, your advisors are totally different. And in my view, this is really also his kind of a shock. And this was something that Amiri has said, how easily identities can change in a modern, modern world. In the way, basically, Amiri was shocked for 20 years. People that had been in SS and Wehrmacht and so on, uh, they became sincerely, in my view, uh, anti-Nazi, it's not that simply they were pretending, they really believe this is bad, as if we were not part of this. But if this can change like this, uh, and if basically this kind of obsession of uh, fluidity and changing identities in the Western world, then how we can be sure that they're going to be Russians in 50 years or 100 years? And this is a huge problem for somebody like him. Because all his legitimacy, the idea to stay in history, because uh, I, this is not about enlightenment, probably. This is about pre-enlightenment. But we know that people are mortal, but we believe that nations are immortal. Uh, and this is why people are ready to die for the nation, because this is the only way to live after his death. But if they're not going to be Russians, who's going to remember him? And also, don't forget that because of the nature of the Soviet history, after all of these kind of a powerful leaders come a revisionist, after Stalin, came Khrushchev. Everybody believes that after Stalin should come Stalin. Uh, and then came Khrushchev. Uh, after Brezhnev came Gorbachev. The idea that after him is going to come somebody to say just the opposite to it, this is what he cannot afford. And this is why the confrontation with the West is more than just geopolitics and so on. This is an identity building. This is the only way to keep the country in the way he likes it. Any last question or question? Then uh, I'd like to thank Ivan Krastev for this fascinating excursus <laughs> from Jean Amory into Russia. Uh, he was also not into Russia. <laughs> <laughs>